good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this panel. I'm so happy that one of the first panel discussions we have is talking about fostering women's livelihoods. But I was actually at the plenary uh, listening to Sri Anand Sinha talk about all of the challenges, and I'm so happy that we get to partner with the NRLM, which is so focused on fostering women's livelihoods. However, the statistics that he rolled out today are very depressing and they continue to depress all of us. So the time obviously for action is very, very uh, urgent. Uh, I think all of us have to come together. I really want to thank the hosts of Charja for bringing many of us together to think about how we can all partner because the big ambitious goal uh, for rural women's livelihoods is to get 25 million additional households, SAG households, into sustainable livelihoods. And that too in a very short period of time because yes, the exigencies of the situations that women especially and their households face currently exacerbated a hundredfold by the COVID pandemic uh, requires that all of us have to really step into mission mode and action mode. Uh, and um, what we do appreciate is how much the government is willing to partner with all of us to make that happen. So uh, I think the dropping and low female labor force participation, et cetera, those statistics are too well known uh, and don't need rehashing by us. What I hope our panel today will focus on is aligning on some of the key barriers that we all have to address, recognize, and work towards uh, removing, and some pathways forward. Uh, I'm so happy that we have such a distinguished panel to discuss these coming from different uh, parts of the problem because livelihoods is such a complex situation. And when you bring women and then the intersectionality of marginalized women from scheduled castes, scheduled types, uh, transgenders, then the problem becomes even far more complex than any of us can sort of imagine. So it's really good to have people who have experience uh, to bring some thought on how we can address that. And we want to leave all of you today uh, with some thought-provoking ideas and maybe some directionality on how to make your own programs and interventions and work far more gender intentional and contribute to this goal, this big ambitious goal, which is just 25 million for rural women. And if we think about all the women in the informal workforce in the urban space, that's another big uh, hoary, audacious goal that we should uh, strive for. Uh, and that's something that we would love to partner and hear more about. So I'm going to kick us off uh, with Aprajita and ask her to really reflect on some of the big investments by government and some forays by the pri private sector on this issue of gender and women's livelihoods. What big gaps do you still see and continue to see? to see, and uh, do you believe that these gaps are more at a systemic level or some that can be addressed in shorter time frames? So, okay. um, thank you, Madhu. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for turning up. I think 2017 was a year when we set up and talked about women's workforce participation because that was the year when it was declared that India is the fifth largest, uh, fifth largest uh, economy in the world. And at the same time, we also saw the numbers that women's workforce participation has fallen to. 23.3 uh, and what was surprising was that percentage was the lowest in India since independence. So a lot of academics, a lot of people like us started thinking about, you know, how do we explain this and of course, how do we solve this issue? Um, Madhu, I'm just going to talk of maybe two gaps and leave the important ones and the difficult ones for my co-panelists to address. I think the first one is um, whenever you talk about women's livelihoods or women's workforce participation, there is a sentence which sums it up. It's not my quote. I've pinched it. But it goes that all women work, but very few get paid or, or get salaries. I think that's a huge problem that we need to look at when it comes to uh, women's workforce participation. And at the, at the core of this is the very gendered burden of housework. Women work in their homes, look after animals, look after children, look after older people, do kitchen gardening. Now, they don't really get paid uh, for all of this work, nor as it counted as quote-unquote livelihood. I think being involved in the domestic work, um, what happens is then you don't have the time to go out and learn skills. Uh, you cannot enter the market without skills. Even if you enter the market, if you have so much of domestic responsibilities, you can't manage both. And inevitably, you leave the workforce and you come back home. Just two data points. Um, 
house work including child care keeps 43% of women outside the labor force and if you ask what percentage of men are kept out of the labor force because of uh, housework any guesses 1.5 not zero <laughs> 1.5 uh the second kind of uh, data point that i want to share with you is that 84% of women's working hours are spent on activities that they, that they don't get paid for whereas for men they spend 80% of the work hours doing stuff that they get paid for so i think this is uh, an an issue that we need to look at uh, madhu if you want to solve the related thing is that even when women work they end up taking the lowest of the lowest paid jobs they work in the unorganized sector where there is no social protection um there is no you know social security workplace protections etc So I think the solution to this because I just don't want to talk only about the problems um the solution is of course that we need to ensure that we have quality child care services across sectors even in the unorganized sector and I'm sure somebody is going to talk about the seva model of how do you do that in the unorganized sector there has to be not just child care facilities but also uh, you know care homes for the elderly i think an equal number of women also are at home because they need to look after the elders in the family Uh, other things could be you know child care facilities at workplaces um, there could be subsidized child care flexi timings remote working etc and i'm really happy that you're talking about child care because i think there's also a huge opportunity as a solution uh, because you can get a double bank for women if you get them child care that's well regulated well organized and safe uh it also opens up a sector of the economy where they can naturally also get paid for so to your point about the 84% work that is not paid for uh imagine a scenario hopefully where women can actually run those child care centers and help other women be uh productive members of the work that they want to do so uh but you also talked up rajita a lot about skilling and saying that women then because there is so much pressure uh they start dropping out of skilled work and to pick up whatever uh low i guess a low skill work and therefore low paid work uh so maybe neera given how much you all work with adolescents through the adolescent collaborative uh, and all of your experience where do you think those skill gaps start emanating and what kind of interventions can one do now uh both from a policy but and also a program intervention yeah so i'm by no means an expert in in gender and livelihoods but thank you for including me in what i was excited about sharing is that we often talk about women as within gender and livelihoods but we need to start a lot earlier so if you just reflect you know on young girls that you know or when you were a young girl if we can really invest at that age which we're saying is 10 to 19 it's a critical age and it's really less what we've learned about employment and it's about employability and so yes you can teach technical skills but it's some of the softer skills we're recognizing that can really help these girls then be you know in gainful employment and so i thought i would touch on uh, a few areas of what can help girls you know be ready for for the workforce i think one thing is really thinking about how can we be proximate to girls closer to their homes because one of the biggest barriers is families don't want their girls to come out when they're in this age of 10 to 19 they want them to stay home they want them to do home care uh they want to keep them go get water and the biggest fear is protecting these girls so that they're ready and ripe sort of for for marriage so there's something at this critical age where they need to be and are kept home so very limited mobility so one is can we move closer to the girl as you begin to engage on employability and skill building i think the second thing is gatekeepers mother-in-laws mothers fathers parents brothers they need to be engaged in supporting girls to be able to address these skills of employability and that's actually where our mindset needs to change and it cuts across class economic status class and education so what i find difficult about these topics is if you do a broad brush across you know all women and all girls but the unfortunate aspect of us in india is the more educated you are the wealthier you are the less likely you want women or girls in your family to work it's looked poorly upon in terms of status and that goes all the way down and cuts all the way across so working with gate 
gatekeepers to be proud of women and girls being able to work and being enabling factors there is the second thing. I think the school, the, se- the third thing is bringing this employability into schools. So we focus a lot on sort of learning outcomes, but if you can get into schools and get to girls as well as boys, on uh, how they can be more employable, train them actually on different sets of skills. We really need to stop providing training on these gender stereotypes. I'm tired of everyone learning how to make blouses, beauty parlors. And that's one way because families are like, oh yeah, that's com- I'm comfortable for my girls and women to learn that. So can we think of you know non-gendered types of roles for girls as well as boys, and that you can start bringing actually into school. So that covers my third and fourth point. And I think the last one, perhaps the most important, is building aspiration. There's a lot of research out there that girls who are aspirational and really have that drive, they will ultimately, with this kind of investment employability, move towards being able to to have jobs. I can add on a little bit, you know, later on what might be some uh, further enabling factors given you know, young people, such a great opportunity. Uh, thanks, Tira, and thanks, Abrajita. So we also have, we're very privileged to have Anita, who's actually going to talk to us about how uh, very ungendered work that they are doing to skill women uh, to become ag entrepreneurs. Uh, and that's a really skilled job, has huge impact on their own incomes that we're seeing, uh, but also impacts more than 200 households of farmers with whom, to whom they provide uh, solid inputs as well as uh, you know, technical support uh, and uh, market linkages. So over to Anita to tell us how that's working and how their program, I think, has become far more gender intentional than it started out and what some of the gaps you see in skilling. Thank you, Madhu. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, Initially, Aprajita stated that about the unpaid work that is mostly, I think, existent in the rural areas. With our 80% of uh, actively economic women engaged because they are engaged in agriculture sector, with around 33% as labor and uh, only 40% are the farmers. So this is the like with the data I'm starting the how serious is the issue we will get to know because. Uh, Though the gender uh, differences are uh, in urban areas, I feel in rural it is far more worse to pull out women uh, from social barriers and constraints. Since Gender Foundation India, in since 2014, we are uh, uh, working with this entrepreneurship, uh, agri entrepreneur development. Uh, model until now we have around uh, 8,000 entrepreneurs. Among them, 20% are women entrepreneurs. So uh, Madhu asked how initially we started it as a general neutral uh, program, but now slowly our focus is towards the uh, like uh, developing 10,000 women entrepreneurs in the next three years uh, funded by uh, BMGF. Uh, we are uh, doing this project in Madhya Pradesh and uh, Bihar in collaboration with SRLMs. Basically, uh, we have uh, explored that SHG model is, uh, uh, though we find it uh, insignificant towards the uh, economic empowerment of the people, uh, except for some savings and this uh, uh, gender specific uh, job, uh, yeah, entrepreneur uh, activities, business activities they are engaged in. No much change, larger change we are able to uh, see as far as this SHG movement is concerned. In despite around 120 million households are under this SHG uh, platform in India. So we were thinking ki how well we could utilize this uh, platform to bring out uh, like women entrepreneurs from the rural areas. So are basically the model it is, uh, so she said ki to reach out women, women, we should be at available at their doorstep. So the four basic problems women face is lack of uh, access to inputs, lack of access to credit, uh, lack of access to advisory services, and then fourth is the market linkage. So these four aspects we tend to uh, give them, give them uh, like uh, at their doorstep, because uh, 
the research study says that uh, male, especially in Bihar, states like UP, Bihar and MP, they move out, male out migration is very uh, prominent and uh, female are left to uh, take care of their holdings. So the research studies say that uh, female generally by nature, they are risk averters and with their low access to all the inputs, they uh, they generally opt for the sustenance agriculture. Hope uh, I'm not very technical. Sustenance agriculture, everybody understands, is basically low risk, low input, and low uh, productive agriculture, wherein they, they their only consumption needs are met. So, so FO, FAO even has reported that if we can give equal access to women farmers in rural areas, we will be able to increase our productivity by around 30 to 40 percent in India. So this is a huge figure. We are investing so much in research and everything just to increase productivity. But one, this little solution, if we can give, we are able to achieve 30 to 40 percent increase in productivity. So, so this is how our uh, thought process began. And uh, we are now, uh, yesterday, interestingly, I had an opportunity to talk to around 50 women entrepreneurs who are undergoing a training uh, and residential training program for around 30 days, leaving away their families and their responsibilities. It was very encouraging to see them talk, listen to them. So what I feel is like, uh, rather than we uh, thrusting upon our ideas from them, it's better, it should be a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach. We should listen to them because they are the solution uh, givers mostly actually. They come out with very beautiful solutions what they exactly need, how well we could be engaged in uh, economic activities. They are the be uh, better solution providers. So we should approach them and ask them. Uh, so one lady who was saying like, uh, uh, why only women are made to talk about or discuss about the women uh, generic issues. It's a, it's an inclusive society. Even they should be the part of entire discussion and uh, they should take part uh, even uh, like uh, as Neera said, they should be also uh, uh, like uh, made aware that uh, engaging women in the economic activities adds to their family income. Wo boli ki hum fere le lete hai, waisa, how she convinced her husband, she said, like during marriage, we take that sad fere, there we take, we are the part of all like, so why not income? Why we are, our income and our earnings is considered a subsidiary. So this, uh, this really yesterday I also, being a, she was just a 10th pass rural woman and now she's 40 and she's uh, into uh, like aspiring to be an uh, entrepreneur in the village. Thanks. Yeah. It's a it's a great point, Anita. I mean, I think learning to uh, appreciate what already they do. So you know, we often say, "Oh, women don't know bookkeeping," and we have to help them do financial planning. But every day, if you run a household with very limited income, you're doing financial planning and bookkeeping every single day in your head. Uh, it's just about making sure that they are more aware. So I know that C three does a lot thinking about this. Uh, and I think there are a couple of issues. One is just this training. So what drives women to be able to actually go out? And how how much do you think, Prajita, when you do the work in the field, do you think digital can play a role in bringing things to women if they're not allowed? Not that we're saying women should not travel and do whatever they want, but can digital, because often women also like to be closer to home for obviously a lot of gendered reasons is going to take us a long time, but we're trying to find solutions. So is there a role for digital, digital plus physical, and how do you get women to become aware of already the skills they have? So maybe that. I mean, I'll begin by picking up on what you said, women are not allowed. I think we cannot have a conversation about women's livelihood without looking at how social norms impact that. So there, we have to deal with social norms. So it's social norms, which is, you know, if the girl is allowed to quote unquote, allowed to be born, uh, it, her education, her skilling, her entry in the market, her, you know, per safety perceptions, all of her use of digital, yes, everything is governed by 
uh, social norms. And I think some of these social norms are really, really depriving women and girls from living their fullest potential, from learning, from being part of the market. I think deeply entrenched, entrenched patriarchal notions about what a woman should do, should not do. Hindi film ke sabse popular dialogue hamare ghar ki bahu betiya kaam pe nahi jayegi. Uh, you know, so all of these are, if you don't look at all of this, I don't think we'll ever be able to get women to the workforce and keep them there. Um, this also, of course, translates to how women are conditioned. Sacrifice. Right? If you are a woman, you have to sacrifice. So you sacrifice your job for your little children. You sacrifice something else. You know, so this whole and ultimate in sacrifice, of course, I'm not saying this for the shock value is the the news that came out of bead that the sugarcane factories were uh, hiring couples and uh, they had to work together in pairs of two and there are villages in beads where 50 percent of women have undergone hysterectomies which is removal surgical removal of the uterus because if when the woman was menstruating the owners felt that they can't do work so they'll take leave so in order to not lose those three four days of labor women had to made to undergo hysterectomy. So this is like an ultimate, you know, of how we should sacrifice for everything else. But coming back to your uh, digital, um, I think, you know, COVID told us that we can't really uh, not look at how to um, fill the digital gender divide. Um, I think even today in India, NFHS 5 tells us that it's just one in three women who have access to internet in rural areas, it's, it's just 25. Of course, we need to get devices uh, to their hands. We need to get last mile connectivity. We need to talk about internet safety, all of that. But I think even before we do that, we have to again look at how much of social norms are going to allow them to really uh, leverage digital forms. In one of our uh, studies in Bihar, which we're doing with the foundation support in the 10 districts of uh, high prevalence of child marriage, uh, the study not only told us that the goal for the women, ultimate and safe goal is marriage. That is the best. You know, then we are not worried about her security, etc. So that's one thing. But the second thing is how much of stigma is attached to women, girls especially, having access to phones. Uh, there was a girl who a father who told us uh, giving the phone to my daughter is like Men apne beti ko chora hai pe bitha diya. So it's it's that kind of an entrenched notion. In Jharkhand, a 17-year-old girl told us that. Everybody in my neighborhood says that if I, any young girl has a phone, who barbad ho, ho gai hai. So I think, yes, digital skilling, last mile connectivity, financial literacy, all of that is important. But while we are doing this, right, we also need to take into account how we dispel some of the social norms, how we change the narrative. How do we talk about, you know, how do we make it safe for girls to uh, go and go to school, go to college, go to work? Because sometimes more than the actual risk or lack of safety, it's also the perception. The college is 10 kilometers away. Sarkar has given a cycle, but who's going to take care of her security when she's cycling 10 kilometers away? So again, I don't, I mean, I think everybody here agrees that, uh, you know, we have to bridge the digital gender divide. We have to look at how we can get it to the last mile, get it to the girl who's most deprived. You know, we are doing a digital literacy program for girls and we were heartbroken because in order to be digitally literate, you have to have basic numeracy and literacy skills. And we had to say 30% of the girls can't join our program because they do not have that. So what happened? The one who is really, really left out can't be part of your good programs. So I think there's a lot. But I guess, you know, even if we design programs on, you know, information, communication technology, and when we say there's going to be a very intentional incorporation of gendered elements, I think those things would help us. So, Nina, <laughs> given that you work a lot with girls, do you see aspirations? Because you were going to talk about aspirations. Do you see aspirations? Uh, and how, uh, and then we'll come to Anita as well, what your experience is. What kind of women are stepping out and can we create role models? Like we have to leave some solutions for people to program. I guess social norms is such a big issue, right? What are the couple of things that we can break some of those barriers? I know, and not to stop, you know, hammering at those, but they are so entrenched. So, Nina, maybe some aspirations and some role modeling. 
So, so, so I think both are needed. I think the unfortunate or fortunate is the aspirations are very much led by what they see. So everybody wants to be a teacher, right? So there, and the women that have played roles in their lives, a policewoman uh, are the two, uh, and that's about it. There are very, and then doctors, nurses, a little bit, but not as, not as much. So I think teachers is out there. Uh, and so we need to bring and share other kinds of opportunities and aspirations for these young girls. And really those role models, like you're saying, are needed and they may not exist definitely in the deep rural areas. And so some aspects of this digital can also not just be the literacy, but also how are we sharing what, why this is, what else is out there? And so mentoring. Over digital, we're seeing to expose girls to what's possible is, is, is an option. But I think we also need to think about it doesn't rest just on the girls because often you can have, I mean, we all know, we all have aspirations. We may not achieve those aspirations, but there need to be others in the system structurally that are supporting some of the building of, of the aspirations or taking care of women or girls so they don't fall out. And I think that responsibility actually rests to some extent in the private sector, right? As well as the government. So on the government side, we need more opportunities to protect in some ways. And on the private sector side, if they can enhance ways to engage and build those aspirations for girls and start putting campaigns out there at a girls level, but for the women create infrastructure to be able to support. I think this is cross cutting for, you know, the most vulnerable women, but also for privileged women who need uh, a range of services, like you were saying, sort of around care and sort of being provided for. Thanks. So quickly, Anita, so that we feel like we can be very positive. So you have experience with yes. tons of now women who are coming in to be ag entrepreneurs. What kind of women and how do you think they've overcome that? So that that helps us think about how we should set up some of those interventions. Yeah. So like uh, the scenario has changed over a de decade. It was really encouraging to see more women coming forward, uh, showing interest in the entrepreneurship. Like they they willingly came ki, we, I also want training. So the COVID has uh, been a d blessing in disguise for us because there were some women who were not able to attend the trainings because they were unable to leave their households and come. But uh, the, through COVID, we could uh, organize offline trainings for around, uh, like since last two years, we were operating in that model. So there were, we could see a, a hike in the number of uh, female participants because they preferred uh, uh, resident, like uh, off, online trainings as compared to the residential training program somewhere in Hyderabad and the headquarter, wherever we were organizing. So that was one change. Despite that, like uh, though we say uh, technologies can, yeah, the, all these modes, but uh, a survey we did it uh, among our uh, entrepreneurs, only 12% had owned their own mobiles. Rest, we're saying ki, my husband has, my son has, I will just uh, borrow it. And this is the scenario at the rural areas. Only 12% are able to operate the mobile phones. I think two things, though, that we need to move from an immediate expectations that every at an individual level will have access, right? I think if we move to centers where you can have digital centers and access for girls and women, I think that might in the interim solve for some of the challenge of, of access. I think the second thing that I would love us, entrepreneurship is not going to solve this livelihood issue. So it's almost like we're expecting all women to be entrepreneurs. Think of how many of us are entrepreneurs that come from privileged backgrounds, education. To actually be an entrepreneur is not that easy. So I don't think that that in and of itself will solve the livelihoods issue. We do need to think about para-skilling. We need to think about salary jobs. By the way, another aspiration is government jobs in the railways. I mean, without a doubt, that's the most exciting one. Yeah. So I'm going to ask each of you to give me quickly one barrier with a solution. I've spoken about the barrier. Can I just talk about the solution now? Yeah, one yeah. solution. Quickly, two. two quick if you allow. So one, I think Single is... Here and now. Yes. I think we have to hold ourselves accountable to being very gender intentional. 
So whether we are making policies in our own office, ensure that girls who have got babies come back to work, babies are allowed in the office, you know, or provide care. Or provide care. So all of that, I think we have to hold ourselves accountable of how do we do it at individual level, organizational level, larger level. Like I, I was talking to Anita about our work with Jivika. There we are integrating gender across in Jivika Bihar. So I think all of that needs to be done. And the, the second solution that I want to talk about is really put pressure on people who run the supply side. And let me explain what I mean. So instead of lamenting, oh, where are the women? Where are the skilled women? Make sure that they have quotas, right? They are, hold, they are held accountable to it, recruiting women at every stage. If you can't file skilled women, then invest in skilling. Uh, you know, do a mapping, skill gap mapping of a geography. Find out what, what the geography needs for economic development and train, find and train girls and women to fulfill that. You know, make sure women have access to e-commerce. I think if women are actually doing very well in e-commerce platforms. Ensure that your factories, your highways have gender sensitive infrastructure. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of highway with no loose. How do you expect women to go to work? So I think, you know, so in gender intentionality and more accountability on people who design supply side intervention. And those are my two solutions. Thank you. Mira. Uh, I would say one of the biggest barriers is ourselves as women. And my solution would be those of us who've had privilege to understand how we got there and support each other. I think often women think they did it on their own and we didn't. We had a lot of support along the way. And so if each of us takes another woman, another girl into you know their arms and support them to overcome their own mindsets of what they feel that they can achieve, I feel that's one easy solution. Great, thank you. Anita. So I would say land ownership and uh, access to the various information and advisory services is a solution for women farmers. I'm talking about farmer, farming only. So yeah. that can uh, like improve uh, women's uh, recognition as farmer. Thank Maybe, you. Yeah. And I think to privilege, it's also about how much access do I have to digital infrastructure for me to be able to work from home, right? So we're still talking about a fairly privileged set of women which is fine if they don't if they stop dropping off but we're also got a lot of data when people come on to those digital platforms yeah. they leave very fast so in terms of our own strategy it's about attracting more women but retaining and, them is and Madhu important. for men to carry some of the yeah. household burden yeah. I mean, do start do doing some yeah it's difficult for uh, it's a uh, you know we have to recognize that there are uh, social norms women's own conditioning uh, actual workload at home because of migration in Bihar, for example, because of which women tend to stay at home. And those are long-term interventions we need to work at, sure. However, you mentioned that we took the services to the doorstep, and that would be very interesting to understand from, uh, you know, uh, how did that work? What did you guys do? What made it successful? Did that help? So you want to understand the model? Uh, I, I just want to know that you you did that, right? You recognized yeah. the problem and you took the services to the door, and yes, did yes. that help? What impact did that create? What did it enable? Yeah. Uh, you know, just wanted to understand that a little better. Quickly, I'll just uh, make uh, brief about the model. Actually, uh, we chose some uh, uh, that women who has those entrepreneurial uh, thirst. To become, we cho chose some uh, from the communities. We gave them training for 21 days. Our field level team is existent in the at the every block level. So we operate at a panchayat, one entrepreneur from one panchayat, so that she can uh, serve around 150 to 200 farmers. So she approaches, she is in touch with all the 200 farmers in the particular village. So, uh, so I, Neera has said that entrepreneur is not a solution because it is not about one individual. She is catering to the needs of around 150 to 200 farmers. That is there. So whoever are in her uh, uh, like uh, service uh, area, they are also getting access to the, all the services, whatever she is getting access. So that way, uh, this model was successful. And women, basically, they are unable to come out because they don't, know, don't have knowledge or information that these things even exist in the outside world. Such opportunities are there. Once they come out and they get a confidence that someone is there to provide you with the support end-to-end -end and handhold them for some period of time. They, so our organization handholds an entrepreneur for around two to three years till they establish themselves. Though this is the difference what we need. And just in terms Thank of you. income, 
the ag entrepreneur can earn between 10 to 15,000 rupees a month and the farmers can earn between uh, an additional income of 1,500 to 2,000. So it's quite a big delta if you can provide them better inputs, better market. Uh, and we heard from women, uh, you know, vaccines, knowing when to give if you're running livestock. So in fact, mortality rates dropped dramatically from 60% of poultry birds to 5% by two interventions, vaccinations and deworming. So bringing those services and like uh, Anita is saying, just giving them that information. Often they don't even receive it because we heard uh, men leave and they don't go out. So they just do subsistence farming, right? And then they don't want to invest because all the birds are died. So I put in some money, they died. Now I gave them vaccines and now they survive. So now I can build more assets. That's kind of the model. Yeah, there's a lot of debate among economists on how to do it. I'm actually the daughter of an economist who worked on this maybe 40 years ago, trying to say, how do you monetize that work? And I think the biggest chunk of that is care work, which is what we're saying. You need to create actually an economic model, right? So you have to value that child care because someone in the household will have to pay or someone in society has to pay for that child to be taken care of. Right now, you're just leveraging it on the shoulders of women, right? Saying, okay, do the child care just because you bore the baby doesn't mean nobody else is responsible, right? So it's a new member in the household. Everyone should be responsible. That's why I think we all index because that's one. Finally, it'll be cooking and caring and elderly care and child care. If we can solve for that, hopefully that's the roadmap for other people. In the in the rural areas, yeah, I think looking after an animals, your you know farm that also it is it accounts for a lot of yeah. Can digital help women? So just for the uh, for for my friends and you, we have uh, delivered digital marketing and graphic designing short term courses to the girls during this COVID period. And these were the girls who have just passed out their class 12th. And today, uh, sir was saying uh, work from home. Today, these girls are earning as much as 20,000 to 30,000 per month to help us. So I, I really uh, appreciate your point that yes, digital by bringing this thing to the, to them, to the last mile delivery can help them a lot. And, uh, Maybe, maybe uh, employability, which you were talking, well, it can be a very good solution uh, by giving this sort of thing to them. And it is very comfortable for, for people like us to, to ensure that it gets. Yeah, no, I think uh, digital skills are going to be something everyone needs to focus on. Making sure, and that Abrajita talked about not even having numeral skills, numeracy skills, literacy skills, but there are now efforts uh, around using artificial intelligence and voice recognition. So even very low or non-literate populations can actually use digital solutions. As uh, Ms. Anita mentioned, with respect to out-migration of men in states, so it's also uh, raised responsibilities of women who are left behind. And when these interventions, for example, even SHGs, which are functional in, in these areas, also tend to add a burden on them with respect to the responsibilities that they already carry in the family and the community. So how can these interventions be inclusive of the responsibilities that they have? How can, for, so that it can enhance women's participation in these interventions? Are you talking about community welfare through the SHGs? Uh, yeah, and also like their role within the SHGs, uh, their participation tends to be like only nominal just because they have so too, so too many responsibilities to handle in general as well. Yeah, I think uh, the SHGs, they come together primarily to do savings, joint savings and access credit. That's where more than 50% of their time is spent in a, in a weekly meeting. Uh, being a member, actually, when we do the survey, they actually find a lot of social empowerment as well. So the social empowerment outcomes are also moving a little bit for them when they come as a group. Um, so we haven't heard. But if there's a lot of unpaid work, and I agree with you that we just say, okay, they are SHG women, you're responsible for COVID response, go and do that. I think that's a fight worth fighting. You should pay for that work. Similarly, for any other intervention. And often, I agree with you, sometimes SRLMs will take that burden on meaning the officials who run it, without consultation on the women. So I think tracking time, 
time yeah. use on that and what what women actually want to talk about uh so i'll say that it's not us somebody had raised we should do it bottom up we should especially uh when we're talking to shg women ask them what they want to spend their time on and most of them want to spend time on livelihoods but some areas that they really want information on is health and that's a kind of across the board across two three surveys uh which we did uh they all showed us the same thing right that they do want credit they want livelihood new information but health is a big area and so i think they do feel a responsibility for family health and we know health can also make you super vulnerable you're not healthy you can't work uh so that's that's one area but it's a good call out we should absolutely ask women what they want to spend their time on yeah to add on just uh, one just point at this point so to order add on to that that the government some government scheme they have introduced women every woman will be given a cow everybody was celebrating but at when when we spoke to the women we said we don't need it it adds to our burden it, it restricts me from moving out now i can't move out because of a cow at my So this is what we don't listen to them. What do they actually need it? Actually, yeah. 